Hey, good morning. Let's go ahead and get ourselves started today with session nine of 120C, 220C. Uh, today, we are going to kind of pick up the thread of uh, kind of looking at reading external data values from image files. It could really be from other sources like Excel spreadsheets or analysis programs. Because we're taking external data values and using them to adapt our elements in Revit. Okay, so we will go through and continue with a whole example of the images and how we can manipulate with that. Uh, that, um, that you'll find out actually is going to be really helpful for like assignment three. Assignment three is actually very quick in that it's pretty much just messing around with an image file and you know, applying it to a surface. So hopefully that will go really quickly for you. Um, in terms of assignment three, just little uh, things you should know about. I believe, I think it's due Thursday night, isn't it? Turn around, very good. And then uh, we'll be around this afternoon, like from four to seven, kind of hanging out here for just general office hours. Also, on Wednesdays, what I've been starting to doing is we do the 120A kind of class, you know, for, for 11 to one, so after one tomorrow afternoon. I'll send something out about that. But in general, if you're here tomorrow afternoon, anytime between like one and six or something like that, we'll just be hanging out again too. Okay. But I think you'll actually have an easy time taking uh, care of uh, assignments. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. In terms of where we were and where we are going, well, it kind of looks like this. We were looking an awful lot about how we could go through and create different sorts of services, different ways, whether we we're going to do that by looking at um, geometry that we defined in Dynamo, or selecting a surface. But either way, we were somehow creating surfaces and adding panels to them. Then we started looking at how we could start adapting those different panels, either to create mathematical patterns or artistic patterns, or even going out and grabbing uh, data from images and applying those. But basically where we're going with all this, it's all about starting to adapt element properties based upon different values that either we're reading or we're computing. And that's a lot of where we're going to go today. We're going to continue to look at the whole idea of the images and how we adapt to that. But then we're going to look very explicitly at how you could go through and uh, evaluate how directly, for example, panels uh, face the sun. Okay, and based on that, adapt their properties so that uh, they're responding smartly to that. So wherever the sun is in the sky, you can have a dynamic structure that's always responding to that, which, as we were talking before class, is part of a biomimicry sort of response. <laughs> Because uh, a lot of plants do that, where they'll adapt and follow the sun, or open or close based upon what's happening. And you know, we can mim uh, mimic those natural behaviors. We tend to be doing things in a very efficient way, as uh, nature tends to be very efficient. Okay, in terms of common operations, we have been looking at all sorts of things like how to manipulate lists. We're going to continue to manipulate lists by flattening them, by uh, chopping them, by adding or removing things from them. List manipulation is just a lot of what we do is kind of work with lists of data and trying to organize it so it's in the same order in which we want to apply it. We look at things like placing points on curves and surfaces, um, getting <coughs> Revit geometry, pulling geometry out of Revit, placing adaptive components. We've done that with beams or like a simple adaptive components as well as panels. And then we're going to spend a lot of time with really adjusting element properties. So the big things we're really going to do a lot of today is really either setting parameters by name or overriding colors. Those are the two most classic things we tend to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to get ourselves started just by looking at that mapping panel images to color. And I sort of revised the example a little bit, broke it down into a couple different steps. Where we were last time is we were looking at just mapping the sampled colors. So we sampled some colors from an image that we imported. And then based on that, we really just sort of applied it. And the steps are pretty you know, direct. We selected an image file by getting it somewhere from our desk. We read the colored images. There's a really great function called image pixels, which returns a list of rows of data. And what we did actually sort of get it to apply, we found was we had to transpose it because the order in which the data was read and the order in which we were applying it to the panels was off a little bit. So we transposed it to go ahead and make it work. Then we finally just over the colors in view. Of course, we had to flatten the list along the way. What we had to do with that is you know, up to this point, it has rows and columns. When it comes time to actually apply it to the panels, they're not divided into rows and columns. It's just a flat list of panels. So we just flatten the list out, and theoretically, everything's in the right order. We're in good shape. Okay. 
What we're going to add to that today is we're going to talk about adding the ability to manipulate and flip the images. So flipping it left and right, flipping it top and bottom. In both those cases, it's going to be a case of using a function called list reverse. We just reverse the order of things. And the difference between flipping left and right and flipping top and bottom really is going to be it's just what order things are in. And then like uh, whether we need to just reverse the list or whether we have to <laughs> transpose the list and then reverse it. And let's just kind of talk about why that is in terms of like, uh, yeah, the need for those two different cases. Let me go ahead and try this. Okay, so basically, if we had a bunch of different data values, okay, and they're in a row, okay, and then in the second row, there's a whole bunch more data values. So second row in here. So here's the deal. If we go through and we take a look at the way those are organized, if these are a list, and the list is really, it's a layer of hierarchies. There's item one and item two in the list, and in that there's another, oh, eight items in each of those different little sublists. If we go through and we take that list and we say reverse it, what's gonna happen is two's gonna go to one and one's gonna go to two. So in this case, the way I've drawn the example here, that would be flipping it vertically. Okay. The idea of flipping it horizontally is just a little bit separate. What we're going to do is take that list right there and just reorganize it so that we're instead getting those columns. Okay. And then we can say that's one, two, three, all the way for eight. When we go through it and we say we want to flip that, we're basically going to basically reverse it in the other direction. Now, the way I've drawn that and the way it actually that turns to work on the example is actually opposite. It's really in the way the image is being laid on the file right now. It's a simple reverse. We'll go ahead and flip it left and right. If we want to go through and flip it top and bottom, what you end up having to do is you have to transpose your reverse and then you actually need to retranspose. And the reason you have to retranspose is you have to get it back into the order in which it's going to be mapped on top of the panels. So you're sort of manipulating, you're sort of putting it into a form, doing the manipulation, and then taking it back out of the form. Okay, so you know, that's where we're going today, is really doing that. Along the way, we're going to learn about how to use an if statement so that we can control and whether that's going to happen or not. And that'll be useful because we might not want to flip our images. But let's see if we can all make that work. If you come on over in to a nearby, like example, let's go to 9.1. And this will look very familiar because it is. It's what we were looking at last time. But we've changed the Dynamo scripting around a little bit, just kind of cleaned it up for the latest uh, version changes. Yeah. So you might remember I have a surface kind of hanging around out there, and what we were going to do is just put some rectangular panels on that surface and then map them to that image. And hopefully you've got a good image to work with today. So go through, and if you can, add in. Let's add in some Dynamo. And we'll start just by uh, kind of putting that very basic surface on here. So let's start with 1A. And in 1A, you might remember we were looking at something like this. Let me pull that back out. Down here at the bottom, we selected a surface. We put the UV grid on the surface. We quadded that. And ultimately, we put this rectangular seamless panel on it. So that should be looking pretty familiar. We do an awful lot of that okay, whenever you want to rationalize the surface. Up above here, we went through and we started working with the image file. We sort of pulled the image file somewhere from your uh, desktop or somewhere on your computer. See so if you can find some image. I got to sort of an image oh, kind of hanging around in my Dropbox that I was using. What I was doing is I read the file from path. And I said image read from file. What that does is it'll go through and the file, that basically says that it's an image file. So it's going to read it as a series of pixels. 
Then we go through and take this image, and we say we're going to sample it. And we're going to sample it. You can really put whatever you want in there. I'm putting 10 by 20 right now. Let me give you some guidance about that. If you put in like 10 by 10 or an even number, you sometimes miss the fact that you're mistransposing or something like that, because it looks the same whether it's right or not. <laughs> okay, so if you put an uneven number, that's the easiest way to tell whether you have the, the lacing of the, the list just right. Okay. And as you put in numbers, realize that as many numbers as you're putting in here, you're creating that many panels. So I'm creating 200 panels here. As you decide to get a really fine image and put 40 by 40 or 50 by 50, you're getting a very large sort of uh, object out there. There's a lot of panels in there. So start simple. You know, see if, you know, the minimum resolution that you can get away with that you think you can sort of understand what's going on with the image, and then add to it. Okay, so 10 by 20 is kind of a good spot. We're going to basically have 10 by 20, it made 11 by 21 points, so 10 by 20 panels. We read those. And we ended up having to transpose it. That's where we ended up last time, right at the end of class. Somehow we had this issue where the image didn't look quite right. And it was because it was sort of breaking it across the lines funny. It was kind of splitting it into two images. So flat transposing helped that. In the end, we just go ahead and flatten the list and apply the element color override view. So let's go ahead and try that. Let's see if we can get that working for everybody. Just give that a run, and let's see if you can put, make your image show up on that thing. Okay, again, this first time what it's going to do, it's going to regenerate all those panels. So that's going to take a little while. Apply them to the surface. If the panels don't apply to your surface, it could be that sometimes surfaces get a little low, kind of almost too contorted, so they have a hard time applying. Let's see what we got over here. See what you have. Let me try and orbit that around a little bit, just so you can sort of see better. Okay. That is my image, but you'll need to sort of point to another image somewhere on your desktop. Now this image, some of you, well you probably wouldn't recognize it right offhand. This is like a little badge image that I put on a lot of like uh, social stuff. So you know, I got a blue checkered shirt, that's my big round head, and that's like just some background images over there. But in this image, yeah, in the image I'm sort of facing from the left hand side, it looks like I'm sort of facing from the right hand side over here. Okay, so I think there's a little flipping necessary, at least if I want the image to be you know, the way it was originally. So here's what we're going to do. So let's start with your image. You got, you got some image mapped out there? Excellent. OK. The first thing we might do, and it seems to be whole, okay, is we might think about going through and doing a little bit of reversing. So reversing will go through and typically flip it. In this case, it's just a reverse without the transpose. It's going to flip it left to right. It all really depends on just the order in which the data and the order of your panel. So it might take a little. Uh, a uh, plane to sort of get that right. So let's just do a simple reverse. What we'll do is between this list transpose, where this list transpose has all this data, okay, and where we actually apply it by flattening it, what I'm going to do is just insert a reverse. So just take that up to reverse and take it back over here. I'm just going to ignore that if for right now. We're going to use that in just a second. So go ahead and try just doing that. And that should flip the image. In my case, it flips it left and right. Maybe a little bit different for your surface, but it flipped. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you've got an image and it is flipping, then you are in pretty good shape. Let's talk about how you can control like, uh, whether that happens or not. Because you, as you continue to develop scripts, would like to give people the option of turning the features on, turning things off based upon the things they want to see in your model. So there's this really great construct called an if, which is good for that. And if works this way. If always has basically a test condition. So for that, what I do is I feed it a Boolean. And a Boolean is actually just one of the different sort of nodes that's available. It's just a true or false. So it starts out looking like that. I just renamed mine flip left right. But 
here's how we want to use this. Think of it as really almost like plumbing. You're just going to figure out what's going through the pipe. So there's this whole notion of if true, that is, I want it flipped, then what I'm going to do is take the reverse list and let that pass through the result. If it's false, I don't want it flipped. What I want to do is actually take the original list and pipe it through. So it's really just a question of which one you're piping through the system. So how that actually looks when you sort of wire it all together here in Dynamo is I take that list reversed, and that's the true condition. So I'm going to put it up here to true. If it's false, I just want to take the transpose <laughs> list, the one that didn't get reversed. So I'm just going to put them side by side here. So you can sort of see I have either true or false. And then the result is actually what's going to get passed downstream. Okay, so that's a really common construct for going through and giving people the option of turning things on and off. Just give them a little boolean and let them flip. And you can play with that and sort of see how that works. Go ahead and give it a run. And let's see, OK, this is the flipped condition. That didn't change it much. Turn off the flip. OK, it'll rotate it back the other way. So not too awfully bad. Let me pause there for a second. Most people sort of get in this sort of if-then sort of thing going on. OK, thanks. So, Flipping is, that's pretty easy, just kind of, who's going to always keep track of the order in which things are. Okay. If we are going to flip it top or bottom, it's actually going to work again very similar, although what I'm going to do is take the list and transpose it, so instead of flipping across the row, I want to flip you know, the rows, so I put the data into columns. So I transpose it, I reverse that, then I untranspose it, put it back into the original order. OK, so try bringing that across if you can. Let's see, why is that necessary? Why do you have to transpose it in order to reverse it in order to transpose it back? It's just because right now, the way the data is, is OK, what's going on in this sort of way? If we look at the data, let's kind of think about it. It's 20 by 10 across right now. If I flip it this way, what this is telling me is the data is actually in columns right now. So when I do a single reverse, is reversing the columns. If you can sort of think of that as being columns. I think this whole image is rotated, so it thinks of that as rows. But the data is going this way right now. So reverse it that way. When I transpose it, I'm basically doing the data this way. So I transpose it to go this way. I flip it. Imagine. OK. And then I retranspose it because that's that. Now when we transpose it, does it reverse it, or does it rotate it 90 degrees? No. It screwed it all up. <laughs> just transpose it. It just, yes. No, I'm saying if you just oh. transpose it. Oh, that'd be an interesting question. OK, let's try it. Let's say, what if we take the result of this, and I'll transpose it and reverse it. OK, but I won't retranspose it. You wouldn't try anything. OK. I had that sort of double image again this time. Yeah. So so take it out of the retransposed. And I think it's really just the issue of since I have 10 by 20, if you try and take the 10 by 20 data and you map it in a 20 by 10 matrix, it just sort of it's just it's just mapping incorrectly. So you get the half row split. Actually, this is exactly what people do when they're doing all this sort of image programming. You get all this, it's this thing about interlacing and whether it works. Okay, so we have now the ability to flip it left or right. We now have flipped it top or bottom. If you want to go through and give yourself a switch so you can turn on and off, top or bottom. Super, we got this like flip top or bottom. This would be the true case. If true, run this through. If false, just pass through the unflipped data. So that would be taking this if true and this if false. So just skip this whole path. Okay. And this is kind of syncing them, um, what is it? Uh, they're not in parallel. This is in sequence. So one thing happens before the other. It's interesting if you separated them. Let me think about that for a second. 
Nah, it's better to go through and uh, think about having them uh, in sequence. So let's go ahead and run that. So that is truly flipped. That's not so flipped. So that gets you the flip left and right. We can think about rotating is actually a little strange. You have to think about the math involved in rotating. I don't remember what it is right off the bat, but it's. What do you have to do to do that? It's almost. Well, the problem with rotating is, you know, the way it is right now, it's not sampled evenly. So if I do rotate it and I have 10 across and 20 up, I'd have to do something, yeah, it won't rotate very nicely. Okay. Of course, it's all, if they're even, it works out. But that's kind of it in terms of basically taking these values. So let me pause there for a second. Okay, so you got the idea of flipping and you got the idea of the if thens Okay, beautiful. Last thing we want to do then is on this example say, hey, okay, it's a lot of fun, you know, we're enjoying this, but let's see if we can make it more useful. Let's not only sort of adjust the color, and the color you might remember only shows up in the shaded view, but let's actually go through and adjust the height. The height could be actually something that will it'll render, or if you thought about Oh, like a concrete or, or our first famous example would be the idea of kind of like a masonry wall where they're sort of embedding like images into the wall just by sort of embossing or debossing the image like right into the wall panels. So really kind of cool. So if you want to think about something like that, we're going to go to the next step, which is really to adjust the panel heights based on the colors. So let's think about that. Essentially, we have this element set parameter by name. Okay, we know about that guy. He's a really useful function. And you might remember that back over here, let's kind of go over and look at one of these elements. What do I have? I have this nice parameter right there, height. And the nice thing about height is I can go ahead and put in some value. And it'll sort of make it bigger. When you first surfaced this, did it naturally have height, or did you add that as a parameter by um, the, the panel itself, this little rectangular seamless panel, it has height as one of the parameters in okay. it. Okay. But if it didn't, I'd go through and add, I'd open up the panel, edit the family. So let's see, if I put in like a 50, that's quite tall. Okay. So let's think about what it means to either emboss or deboss things. Like right now, by default, all these things have one as their height. Okay. We're going to go through and change the heights based on the color values. Okay. And color values are usually 0 to 255. Okay. So if we want to go through and change this sort of surface based on these values 0 to 255, we can't map it directly because you have to worry about that zero case. Yeah, that pure white or that pure black. The zero case and the height won't like each other. Okay. So we're going to take whatever the color value is and you know it's zero to 255. We're going to go through and map it into some range of heights that you consider to be acceptable. You know, whether it's 10 to 20 or 10 to 100 or however much variation. And you could put in your own factor to sort of say really how, you know, what the base level is and how high you would allow them to be. Embossing is actually pretty easy. If we're going to add the values positively, you always have to sort of say here's the base and then go ahead and, you know, allow <coughs> the range to get higher. If you want to, I guess that's debossing. Embossing, the opposite, where it sort of carves in, is a little bit harder because you have to make sure the base is high enough that when you carve in, Okay, that the lowest value of the carved in ones is always greater than zero. Mm -hmm. So either way, it's very much like the sine wave function where we have the base height and you just always have to make sure that the height of things stay above zero. So we're going to play a similar sort of game here. Okay, so let's talk about this. We got all these colors, okay, and these colors, which represent themselves nicely in these RGB values, actually have numeric values. So we can use some functions, I believe it's color hue and color brightness to convert those colors into like a two, you know, 0 to 255 sort of range. And let's see how that works. I got this nice looking list of colors here. Look at all those colors. Let me zoom on in there and take a look. Okay, red, green, blue values and an alpha value. Okay. 
If I want to say what is the hue and map that on some hue number, okay, let's try that. What I'm going to do is say let's take color, and I think it's dot hue. I just have to remember. There it is. It's the true the hue value for the color. Okay, let's check this out. I'm going to take these colors. And we'll run this. It's going to give me a whole bunch of different values. And you kind of check out the range of values in there. Oh, I actually do have a zero. I have a pure, give it to the pure white or pure black. I'm trying to remember. Oops, what else do I have? 300s in there? I have a 358. So I'm thinking about the hue values wrong in terms of their range. Here's a 348 right there. Okay. Hmm. Got to think how much the hue values can actually be. I was thinking 0 to 255, but I'm wrong because I can see right there. The double number. Let's check this out. I'm sort of curious now about what the range is. Oh, I guess that, that makes sense. It's kind of like a color wheel. Okay. I'll, I'll go with that. RGB is there to do five. Okay, 360. Oh, I'll take that. Thank you. Okay, so if it's 0 to 360, here's what I want to do. I have that nice range of those in there. Let's even try, oh, color brightness. Color brightness is another. Kind of wake looking at it. Hue is sort of where you are anywhere from yellow to red to blue to green, you know, all the way around. It's kind of your sort of where you are in the color wheel going around. Brightness is actually, it's kind of really, it's the degree of whiteness to blackness you have. So in any of the different colors, for example, oh, these items down in here where my mouse is pointing right now, they're very, very bright. These guys over here are very, very dark. Independent of the color, they just have a lot of black in them. Get a lot of gray in them versus whiteness. Okay, so you could also map those into brightness if you want to. Kind of check out what those values are. So looks like this is more of a range of zero to one. Okay. In any case, what I want to do is somehow map those into a range <coughs> that I can go through and use. Um, just uh, to go through and change the height of these panels. Right now I'm changing the height. If this was a nice aperture opening, I could change the size of the aperture. I could change some property of it. So let's take our hue values and think about that. If I've got these 0 to 360s, let's go ahead and do this. I'll say remap range. Pop that over here. That's good. My numbers are coming in over here. So at the bottom end of our range is that's the lowest height. If something was zero on the color, what height you would want it to have? Okay, so I'm just gonna make that one or something like that. Okay, at the other end of the extreme is really what the new max is gonna be. That's the highest of the high. Okay. And you can decide what you want to do in there. We can put a single number in there. You can put some sort of an integer slider in there based upon you want to be able to kind of amplify or you know, not. So let me even do that. I'll put a little uh, slider in here just because I want to give myself some flexibility. It doesn't have to be an integer slider. It could actually be uh, another slider. In this, I am going to allow that it's going to be anywhere from let us say, oh, I don't want to be zero at the tail end, so one would be the absolute minimum. That would actually sort of just flatten it all out so you wouldn't see any effect at all. Let's say that it's going to go up to 20. Yeah, I'll say 50. And I'm going to start it with a value of 10. Okay, so 
This is going to be my min. That's going to be my max. Okay, let's check it out. I expect to see numbers, a lot of numbers between 1 and 10. So let's see what they look like. I'll run that. Okay, not too awfully bad. So, if I got a bunch of numbers, I got a lot of elements, and I want to set the heights to be those numbers, I'll do element set parameter by name using the parameter height and feed those values. So, that's where we are. We say element set parameter by name. Okay, so let's think about what fills in all this. For the elements, if you want to go through and basically get those adaptive components that you pull out, you know, probably the better thing to do is pull it from here where we already have them overridden by color. So I'll probably pull that into the element. That's the list of elements. In terms of the parameter name, that looks like just height, so I'll just make it in a string, H-I-G-H-T. <coughs> Actually, I should tell you, every once in a while, I'm inconsistent about this. In some of the older examples, you'll still see using the string as a node name. That's really, that's equivalent. If I, although if you do it as string, you don't have to put it in quotes. So those two things are essentially the same thing. Finally, we need some values. So let's go ahead and throw some values down in there. And give it a run. OK, this is actually going to find, this takes a little more time because in this case, it's going to adjust all those things. Just computing the math values of the numbers and making them a math remapping the range, that was really quick, because that's just a lot of math happening in Dynamo. This part actually is a little harder, because it has to go through all 200 of those elements and change all their heights independently. So that's what's going on there. That's why it took a little bit longer. So we're coming back over here. We're slightly embossed or debossed. That's not very interesting looking, though. That's sort of uh, kind of high or low. Let's see some variation there. Okay. But if you want to sort of amplify that a little bit, just go ahead and turn up your integer slider. Let's say let's make it, oh, more on the order of 30 or something like that. It should have a much more dramatic effect. It's a working. It's a working. This is that one, especially now. If you have your 50 by 50s, that can be taking quite a while to do that. Okay, so that's just a simple example here working with the color files here. The same thing here we're going to do with color, working with color files. We could just as easily, if you had a big old <coughs> Excel spreadsheet and in the Excel spreadsheet you computed some really interesting pattern for how you wanted the panels to be based on something you were able to compute in Excel. We could take that data in and read in that data and use those values to set the parameter by name. It's really essentially the same, just whether you're reading an image file, whether you're reading a data file, whether it's a text file or a CSV file or whatever it is, it's just mapping them across there. Okay. So that's the beginning of all this, although what we're going to talk about in just a second is how we can, as opposed to sort of reading these external data files, just really we're going to compute some values just based upon where the sun is and like uh, how our engines or our panels line up relative to the sun. But let's just pause here for a second. So most of you, do you have some sort of embossed thing popping up like that? Or debossed, I guess it is. Okay. If you were going to flip it so that as opposed to the high values popping out, the high values were going in, okay, think about in your own mind how you would do that. Again, there's usually a base, 
and then you're subtracting from the base, or you're, you're doing some sort of transform. It's the same sort of issue, it's just there's met, uh, you always have to make sure that the, you always stay greater than zero. Okay. Make sense? Beauty. Okay, let us pause on this then, because that really is essentially what you need like for assignment three. I think, you know, with all that, you know, you, you'll just blast through assignment three. It's pretty quick. Okay, super. So, Oh, but then I have to look. Oh, she's doing like a triangle. It's cool. It looks like a landscape, like a real landscape, because the blues are high. Oh, that's like actually kind of cool. <laughs> so, like, if you made pan like really flat, it would be like the earth, and then the green would be higher. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you're saying. Is that what you're saying now? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, so that's what it looks like. It looks really cool. Like, it literally looks like that. That was Okay, let us then switch our gears a little bit and talk about where we're going to go next. Very cool. Well, hmm. okay. Let us then, we're going to talk ever so briefly about really, oh, thinking about the sun and how we stop to think about the sun. And in general, as we're going to be thinking about the sun, let's just start with the overall kind of overview of what we're going to do. It's all going to start with the notion that the sun is somehow up in the sky, and wherever we are, we can always draw a vector between us and the sun. So it all starts with vectors. So let's just kind of think about this. And we're going to think about <coughs> dot products as opposed to cross products. But again, this is one of those ones where it's like all those things I, perp I know I know, don't know how to spell. You know, if you ask me about this, I'll continue to get confused about what the meaning is. But if I play with it for a second, I'll get myself recentered. OK, so let's just go ahead. And I'm drawing a nice little, it's sort of a 3D version of a panel. And it's just kind of hanging out there like uh, on the relatively flat floor right now. If I thought about it, this thing actually has something called a normal to it. So there's some sort of normal vector that's perpendicular to the surface. Okay. And based on that, we can start thinking about how direct or indirect you are to different things. Now I'm going to draw my sun just kind of over here right now. Okay. And if I thought about really having a vector from the center of the panel up to the sun, there's an angle between those two things. And this is what we're going to go through and try to exploit, is that angle right there. Because what happens is, if those two vectors are aligned, okay, if they're very straight aligned with each other, that means you have a very strong alignment with the sun. Like right now, it's kind of okay in terms of the alignment. Yeah, we have a pretty good alignment. If the sun were up here in the sky right on top, we'd say we have an incredibly good alignment. Yeah, that thing is perfectly perpendicular. You know, at least the panel is facing it directly. Things are actually looking really, really good right now. Okay. If, on the other hand, the sun were way down on the horizon over here, and it was like that, okay, yeah, we wouldn't have such a good dot product. So what we're going to play around with is really the dot product between this blue vector okay, and the green vectors. And here's the way it basically works. If the blue vector and the green vector are perpendicular to each other, you get a value of zero. Okay. If the blue vector and the green vector are completely aligned like that, you have a value of one. It's incredibly strongly aligned. If it's somewhere between, you'll have some value like, oh, 0.7 or 0.6. You'll just have some value in between. And we're going to use the notion of a vector and the dot product to actually always figure out how direct something is to the sun. 
So it's a pretty simple principle underneath it all, but it's a little bit strange in terms of like uh, just thinking about how it's implemented in Dynamo. But let's just check it out. So there's an example 9.2, exploring vector.products, and open it up for a second. It's just got a couple nodes in it. And for that one, you could actually just do it in a regular uh, Revit file. There's no Revit file that accompanies it. So you could even just leave this existing Revit file open if you want. But we'll say that basically we'll add in Dynamo, it's 9.2, I think it is. There's just a little geometry out there right now. I'm just going to show you my geometry. I basically have right now just a single vector, which is kind of pointing up straight up into the sky. That's just along the z-axis. Okay. And what I do is just play around a little bit with this vector over here and basically just look at the strength of the dot product between those two. So I'll put that back on. And let's see what's going on. How I created this was I have this thing called just basically a test normal vector. Let me see if I can pop, pop that out for you. What I'm doing down here is I'm basically just feeding in the value of 1. Okay. Uh, actually, this vector right here is the z-axis. There's something called the vector z-axis. That's the one that's just kind of popping it up here, straight up in the sky. This other vector, the vector that I'm testing, is the one over here. And what I'm doing is basically I'm taking something from 1, 1, and I'm giving it a z value up here to kind of put a point up in the sky. Basically, as I increase the z value, What's going to happen is that's going to get taller and taller, so the vector is going to get higher and straight, closer and closer to vertical. Yeah? Is there a reason why background preview disappears? Oh, it's in some of the machines, it's just messed up. That's all I can say. But it's really. So, but both of my machines are messed up then? It's interesting. Go back over here and uh, let's see under view. Let's say background preview. Say, try, try that one. And it's grayed out. So, not sure. Yeah, it's, yeah, it happens on some of the machines. I think we just really need to reinstall that. I just did it. And it's still doing it? Don't know. It's like, try on that one for now. Okay, so. Here's what we're going to do is we're going to go through and play around and basically by dragging the slider up and down, it's going to go uh, make it stronger and stronger in the vertical direction. Right now it's 1, 1, 1, so it's going 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Okay, so basically it's not very strong, but let's go ahead and just kind of pull that up. If you sort of slide that up. You'll see as the z value gets very high, that gets stronger and stronger as though it's pointing towards the sky. But what we want to do is just sort of see what the dot product is of those two different things. So for example, if I make this very, very tall, so it's pointing almost straight up in the sky, you'll see what I'm doing is <coughs> I have a vector. I have the vector to the z-axis. axis. I do the dot product of the two, and I get a very strong dot product. It's like 0.99. So those two things are considered to be you know, almost perfectly aligned. Very, very good. Okay. If, on the other hand, I slide that down, what you're going to see is the dot product is going to get less and less. So for example, if, as opposed to being so high in the sky, I pointed to a point which is really more Oh, let me just do it at zero. Okay. You'll see when it's zero and it's lying flat on the ground and this is straight up, the dot product's actually zero. Okay. So that indicates something that's just perpendicular to it. If you go through and put a negative number in there, if you let it actually slide below the ground, 
what's going to happen is the dot product turns negative. Okay, so you can think about those things. If it's a strong positive number, it's an uh, acute angle. If it's a less than zero, if it's a negative number, it's the strength of the opposite direction. In both cases, they're pretty good. It's really just an issue of really how perpendicular you are to it. But we're going to go ahead and use this feature, though, to really sort of evaluate all of our panels by basically saying for every panel, let's go ahead and sort of compute this normal vector and see how strongly it aligns. Okay, and something else. Let me just pause there for a second because the whole does the dot product stuff sort of makes sense in terms of why that works. Okay, beautiful. I'll make that back to 10. And the function we're going to use really is just that simple. What we're going to do is we're going to have a vector. Here I drew a vector as a point. I drew a line between it. But it's really a vector dot. Can you do that? Actually, let me try the other. Let's see if it's there. Just because in my own mind, vector cross. Oops. One thing. So I will do the cross product of those vectors instead. Actually, that's interesting. That's not a single number. That actually is giving me, that's like, yeah, that, that really is a cross product. Okay, never mind. I just, I think in my own mind, I'm always confusing cross products and dot products, which is uh, not a good thing to do. Okay, we'll leave it at dot products and we're in good shape. Okay, so what we're going to do is always be evaluating, basically for any panel, we're going to look at the vector off the panel, we're going to look at the vector that points towards where the sun is right now, and then like that, try and connect those two things together. Okay, you might wonder about the sun direction, and there's actually a way of figuring that out in Revit. Let's tell you what it is or a dynamo. There's something called sun settings current. Okay. And that is just grabbing the sun settings that are currently in Revit. There's something called the sun direction, okay, which is a vector to it. Okay. And I will just kind of play with that and sort of show you where they both look like. Hold that down right now. This is a vector pointing towards the sun. Now, the sun actually has a location. If I go back over to Revit for a second, yeah, you often don't think about where the sun is, but it's hanging around out here all the time. Let me just turn on the sun location right now. Let's say the sun settings. Okay. Right now, I'm in Boston, Mass. I have still on August 10th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, we can adjust that to really be wherever we want to. You want to be still, that'll work the best in terms of that's a single location. Single day is a range of values through the day. Multi-day is a range of values through the uh, uh, year. Okay. Uh, but you don't want to be lighting. Lighting is actually sort of a funny thing. Lighting is really just, it's used as though you put a source of light in the sky just at a specific location. So that won't respond as you know, the time changes. So still really the way to be. And how did you get to the sun settings again? Okay, where you do it is uh, down at the bottom. Looks like oh, a little okay. sunshine down there. And sun settings is the top. Great. So let's go ahead and say still, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll leave it at that for now. And I can show the sun by saying sun path on. And what you'll see is... There's our little heliodon. Okay, so you can sort of see there's the sun at 4 o'clock in the afternoon right now. Okay, at August 10th. That heliodon works pretty well in that if you go through and you enter a new time, for example, I want that to be 10 in the morning. The sun will go popping on over there. If you shift it over, so as opposed to being in August, it's more like in March, you'll see the sun path changes. But it's actually pretty accurate in terms of what's going on. Actually, even as we're doing this, let me try this. This is shaded right now, right? Let me see this shaded. Yep. Okay. Watch what happens to the photo as I change it around. 
I'm not sure if you can sort of see. It's a little bit bright over here. It's a little darker over there. Let me shift that over to like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. I'm not sure if you could spot what happened now at 4 in the afternoon. This side is really bright and that side's darker. So the shading is responding to that. It's sort of responding to that. But we can use that information. Like the shading already sort of knows a little about that, but we're going to use it even a little bit more explicitly. Where what we're going to do is we're going to say, let's go ahead and grab that sun position. You'll sort of see it has some sort of altitude and azimuth. Let's come over here. Let me rewind that or run that again. That's actually running automatically. Okay. We'll say over here there's a vector to the sun. Notice the vector of the sun has a length of 100. So what I do is I will usually normalize the vector to the sun. What does that do? It keeps the same direction. It just brings it back to a length of 1. Okay. And that's really just so that we can sort of uh, avoid the whole issue of length and just think about it purely in terms of direction. We're just normalizing it so yeah, if we're <laughs> multiplying that together, if we had to worry about length, it'd go from like 0 to 100. We're only going to go from 0 to 1. So I got that vector. So we can go through and take that vector and take the vector that we're testing and dot plot those two and really start to see uh, you know, how things are relative to the sun's condition right now. So for example, if I take that vector, and I do the vector from the sun, as well as the little vector that I'm moving in the sky, you'll see I have different dot products right now. So let's think about this. Okay, Right now, you can sort of see my little test vector. That's this guy over here. I can even hide the z vector right now, just so you can't see it. Let me just turn off that little z-axis guy. I'll put that there. Let me just turn off the line. Okay. So you see, there's my test vector. And you can sort of see, oh, basically, with well, the strength of it right now is not considered to be very strong. It's only 0.13 relative to the sunshine. Let's go ahead and kind of play with that a little bit. For example, here it is right now. We're sort of up in the sky right now. If I flip that over a little bit, uh, let me go ahead and raise it up a little bit higher. This is almost more direct in the sky. I think what's happening is the dot product's actually getting a little bit better. And the reason is it's at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm pointing straight up in the sky as though it was noontime or something like that. Let's try this. Let's go back to Revit. And we'll say over here, not be 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's change that closer to noontime. So the sun is very high up in the sky. So the dot product is like 0.67. It's getting much better. Okay. Notice it's still not like 1. The reason is, you'll see even the sun is not directly overhead. We're kind of at 0, 0, 0. And it's actually kind of off at a slight angle, kind of based upon where we are. If we were even oh, higher in the sky, though, that might be even closer. Like, for example, if it was June, that'd be even higher in the sky. So I think that it's got to 0.93 right now. Okay. So this whole idea of dot products works pretty well for us. This is kind of an you know, abstract example. We'll put it into like a real terms in just a second here. But that's the idea. It's really all going to be taking these vectors, computing that, and based upon that, sort of saying whether or not you're strong or not. Okay, so we can go through and compute that pretty easily. We'll look at that in the next example. What we're going to do after we compute that, though, is we're going to start thinking about things we would want to change about our surface. So if, for example, if when the sun is directly overhead, we would like to have shade, so that we can go through and protect ourselves and not worry about getting hot. We can adjust the parameters to do that. Other things we could do is we could use this evaluation 
to say, oh, like which of these different panels would be the best places to put solar panels? Because we can sort of figure out that really who's the most direct and who isn't. So I have to go through and place those. So we will do all that when you return in five. Let's go ahead and break, and when you come on back, we will uh, just do a little uh, calculating of the surface and the sun and trying to figure out how to put all these pieces together. I know we'll go over it on Thursday, but 